G'day, I'm Nick Bowditch from nickbowditch.com. Today I want to talk about a style of counselling that I use quite a bit in my own practice, and that is motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing is a conversation about change. It was first described by William Miller back in 1983 and first used effectively in people who were trying to escape an addiction to alcohol. And it's still something that I use quite a bit in my practice with the people who are trying to control their own addictions. It's a guided style of communication where you balance actively listening as well as giving advice. It really empowers the client because what you're doing is taking their ideas and their hopes and dreams and having them follow through on their own ideas. It's really deeply rooted in empathy and being able to communicate that empathy authentically. Motivational interviewing is really useful with clients who have high ambivalence, but low confidence, low desire, and low importance. The most pointless thing a therapist can do is try to convince someone else that something is important and something needs to change if they don't think it's important. Instead, motivational interviewing looks at why they don't change. You know, do they even want to change? And if they did, what would those changes look like? Motivational interviewing makes three basic assumptions. One, that people have a crazy ability to be the agents of their own change. Two, that the therapist is one of the most important parts and most important factors in the positive outcome for a client. And three, success and empathy of the therapist are directly related. So why is empathy so important? Well, Miller found that when there was confrontation and when there was challenge by the therapist to the client and it wasn't a two-way street and it was the therapist trying to impose their ideas, the therapy was much less successful. So how does it work? Well, the role of the therapist is to try to avoid being an expert and instead being a partner. We have to promote the client autonomy throughout the whole process, putting it back on them that they're in charge of the process, that it's their hopes and dreams we're trying to achieve. We have to be a real empathy champion. You know, we have to be able to portray that empathy really authentically. And we have to be a prospector rather than a provider. So we have to prospect for ideas, for things that are in them, listen for things that they mention, try to work out what they're actually wanting to do rather than providing them with ideas or telling them what the solution might be. The role of the client is three basic things. To be really honest, to be really open-minded and at least open to change, and then to be really realistic in their goals. There's a few things to remember for the therapist to make motivational interviewing really effective. One, open-ended questions. Not to say, you know, are you good? Will you do that? Things that can be answered yes or no. The reason open-ended questions work is it gets the, ther the client doing all of the talking. So things like, what would it look like if? Or what has made you think that? Or, you know, really open-ended questions that invite the client to say something back. That's the first thing. The second thing is affirmation. And to be able to affirm people in a authentic and realistic way. So something like, wow, that must be really difficult. Or, gee, that sounds like it's been hard. Like, is it time, do you think, to make a change? Or, I'm really proud of what you've done so far. I'm really happy with the effort you've put in. Things like that, that, that affirm the client and make them feel good and want to keep going, but aren't cheesy or, or cliche-ish, right? So the third thing then is reflective learning. So to be able to listen, actively listen and reflect on what's being said and being able to put back to them then in a way that they might be able to pick up their own words of change, their own phrases that make them think they want to change as well. And then finally, summarizing as we go. So being able to say, okay, so you said that the last week you said this was important to you, you know, how was important is it today? Or Gee, it sounds like you've you've really had enough of that lifestyle. You want to exercise more or you want to do, make a change. You know, some sort of summary and paraphrasing really makes it an effective way to, to give the, the client back the communication that they gave, gave to you and make them convinced even more that this is all their idea and everything is coming from them rather than from us. Be really careful that you're not confusing the client's motivation 
and your own motivation as a therapist. Particularly if someone's a little bit codependent like me, to be able to disconnect from that and say, okay, I, it doesn't matter what I want for this client, what matters is what they want for themselves. And to be able to really reiterate back to them all the time, this was your idea, these were the things that you said you would do, you know, this is your motivation. And sometimes that can be difficult because we can really want more from them than they're able to give. We want them to move more, we want them to exercise more, we want them to get outside more, and they're fighting that all the time. So. We've just got to be really aware of what their motivations are and work towards those as opposed to what we want for them and working towards that. And in that is something called the writing reflex where people like me who are a little bit codependent again try to fix everything. These people aren't broken. There's nothing wrong with them. They just need a little bit of help to get past some blockages or get past some past thinking that isn't really healthy or whatever. So. That, that writing reflex is something we have to fight all the time. We're not fixers, we're partners. To fight that writing reflex, ask these five questions. Why would you make the change? One, how can you make the change? What are the three best things that will come if you make that change? How important to you is that change? And then finally, what are you going to do? So let's see some practical examples of how motivational interviewing can help people introduce more exercise into their life, introduce more movement into their life, and be healthier in the long term. So in what way do you think your life might improve if you introduce more exercise this week? So can you give me a number between 1 and 10, where 1 is really not interested and 10 is super excited? Um, how excited you are about making those changes this week. Okay, so given all that, how, how much more exercise do you think you can fit into this week coming? If you were able to move and exercise more, what would, what would that look like? Okay, so of all those things you said you would like to do, what would you like to try this week? Okay, so again, on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is not very confident, but 10 is super confident, how confident are you do you think you can make those changes for this week coming? All right, so, so could you text me in a week and just let me know how you've gone with that and how many times you've done that? Okay, so to recap, motivational interviewing is a really effective way to introduce more exercise and movement into someone's life. Because 1, they feel listened to, and not preached at by someone they think is an expert. And two, they feel really empowered by being able to say what they want to do and both the therapist and them working towards their goals as opposed to what somebody else might want for them. We're really just dragging out what they want to do and then putting it back in their control. <laughs>